Today, um, yeah, it is International Working Women's Day today, and also um, last month it was 100 years since some women got the vote, um, and 90 years since universal suffrage, so the, the majority of people got the vote. Um, so I think it's quite an important topic to be discussing, really, especially because recently in the media and um, in the news we've heard a lot about the inequalities that women still face. So it's interesting to look at the struggle that took place for the vote and why that happened and how people's hopes were kind of pinned on that vote causing real change and look at like what lessons can we learn for that to create real change for the future. Um, so how did it all start is a, is a good place to start. Um, so sort of the main kind of point at which the struggle for women's vote starts to become organised happens in 1866, so a long time before the vote was actually gained. So there's 50 years of, of struggle for the, the vote for women in particular, and obviously that's precursored by lots of other events, including the charters that I'll come on to talk to in a minute. Um, so a petition was, was gathered in um, 1866 by um, a society, the Kensington Society, that was largely made up of, of middle-class, uh, well-educated women. Um, although it tried to reach out to um, more working-class areas, this was kind of the, the people who were predominantly taking a lead to begin with. Um, and it did develop into a more national movement, um, with the first petition gaining about 1,500 signatures to, to the later petitions going up to half a million at a time. Um, so it really did pick up pace with the petitioning and the, and the organising that started with this initial... Um, kind of petition and they were quite um, unfortunate in the fact that women weren't allowed to present to parliament and things and so a liberal, the liberal MP, um, John Stuart Mill, um, who had previously campaigned um, to become elected himself on women having the vote, so this was an idea that before organised action took place was already being discussed in society so he ran on um, the idea of you know getting women the vote um, and, and so he was the one chosen to put this forward to Parliament. Obviously it failed um, the first petition, but it meant that um, you know, 73 MPs voted in favour of it and they showed those MPs and they won them over by showing that um, kind of defeating conservative attitudes in society and saying, well, look, women can organise themselves, this is for women, and they do want the vote because, as we'll show later, many women did actually not want the vote. They thought that that was incorrect and that was a wrong thing to do and they shouldn't have it. So um, you can kind of see from very early on that there was already beginnings of change being thought about in people's consciousnesses and then this organisation really started to galvanise the movement. Um, and it's from here on that we start to see the events starting to kind of pick up a little bit. Um, but we can, I think, sort of learn from this transition from just people discussing it to organised events starting to happen, um, that it was activism and campaigning that was a crucial method for people really starting to make a change. It wasn't that this idea that, you know, conservatism and, and these backward views will just gradually wither away in society. It wasn't that at all that caused the change. It was people beginning to organise themselves in groups that were active, campaigning and, act, you know, trying to do things to reach out to other people to change their perspectives and to really make a change to society. Um, of course, the material conditions um, of the time as Marxists are really important for us to look at, and this is really what we started to kind of... Um, with the Chartist movement that happened um, shortly before this. Um, and, you know, it kind of, I, w I suppose you could say the Chartist movement kind of like trailblazed activism and, and it was this campaign for, um, for votes and to end slavery um, that had begun before that really gave the movement a kind of um, method to look to, to be like, right, well, how, how do we begin our campaigning? How do we begin to organise ourselves? Um, and in addition to this um, precursory activism, women also had, had begin to f began to feel that you know the government takes a big role in our lives. It makes decisions that affect us directly. Therefore, we should get a say in that. Um, and it led Mill to quite an interesting quote, I think, that really kind of lays bare sort of the class divisions within the movement itself. Um, he says, "Can it be pretended that women who manage an estate or conduct a business so?" property ruling class women who pay rates and taxes often to a large amount and frequently from their own earnings many of whom are responsible heads of families and some of whom in the capacity of school mistresses teach much more than a great number of male electors have ever learnt and not capable of a function of which every male householder is capable um and i think this is quite an interesting statement because he kind of is pitching the the need for women to have the vote on the basis that well they they're business people too they they pay into the taxes um they own property therefore they should get the vote and it kind of um 
I think that's a really good indicator of the starting position that their campaign began from, that it was and, and succeeded in getting propertied women the vote. Um, and obviously that that's not um, the end of it, and that wasn't good enough for the majority of women because it meant that working-class women still weren't involved. And I think... Um, you know, John John Mill's a good example of how um, people kind of viewed the vote for women to begin with. Um, so um, the third kind of condition on top of the, the Chartists and this um, kind of attitude um, was that men had been campaigning for reform in Parliament for a lot, a lot longer and an extension of the vote in general. So it was also part of general consciousness that the vote could be extended and that this was a possibility. And that, that might lead to real change in society, not just, um, it wasn't just a panacea, it was just that people thought this was the beginning of, of a step to real change. Um, so two years later, after this initial petition, as I said, the, the petitions that they continued to put to Parliament began to pick up pace. The next got in 21,000 signatures, um, and by the end of the 19th century, so still a good, like, 35 years on, um, there was they were beginning to get a quarter of a million signatures, and that was spread much more widely throughout society, so beginning to reach more working-class women and women outside of the, the major cities and outside of London in particular. Um so as I said, women were beginning to see the vote as a kind of way to solve any political, social and economic problems that they face as a, as a kind of stepping point to, to making real change. Um, and so it became a real lightning rod for the majority of women looking to see change in their lives, not just for those who wanted like political representation, but people who wanted changes elsewhere. Um, and so we begin to see the establishment of big, large organisations, in particular the National Society for Women's Suffrage in, in 1867, which had um, groups all around the country and, and specific organisations that were, were spread um, widely throughout towns and cities. Um, and um, at the same time, of course, we see the development of, of the anti-suffrage campaign. So I'm going to kind of tackle them first and then come back to the suffragettes and the suffragists. Um, so throughout the 1880s in particular, the anti-suffrage movement really developed. And like I said to begin with, this was um, not just men who thought women shouldn't have the vote, but also women who had kind of like internalised their own oppression and, and genuinely believed that women weren't capable of voting or shouldn't vote. Um, and these views were often based on the idea that, you know, a husband uh, can make all the decisions for the woman. They know them, therefore they can make those decisions. And, um, you know... There was one particular prominent woman um, who really kind of spearheaded this idea, and she uh, was Mrs Humphrey Ward, as she liked to be known, who founded the Women's National Anti-Suffrage League. Um, and she genuinely believed and talked about in, in meetings to thousands of women. These were no small groups, and obviously the majority of these women at the time were also quite working-class women. Um, she really believed that um, constitutional, legal, financial, military and international problems were problems that only men were able to solve. She thought that that was, that was the limitations of women. Um, and she also similarly gathered petitions that I think speak quite loudly with 250,000 signatures um, which were obviously widely reported in the Times, which is no surprise, um, stating that the emancipatory process, so like the process of em emancipating women in particular, has now reached the limits fixed by the physical constitution of women. So they believe that, like, well, petitioning and organising is all very well, but that's it, really, that's it. You've, you've, uh, you've reached your limit. There's nothing more that you're capable of doing, so you should give it up now, really. This is ridiculous. We're going to campaign against you. Um, and they were kind of bringing women in to the anti-suffrage movement as a consequence of the actions of the suffragettes in some cases. And, and many of these women testified and, and stated in their statements that the reason why they were part of the um, anti-suffragist movement was partly because they were so scandalised by the tactics as well as in this internalised um, oppression that they kind of um, maintained. Um, of course, in addition to these women, there was loads of other groups um, that, of, of men and um, people that were completely against uh, women having the vote. And it's no surprise, again, that the Conservative Party were opposed to um, suffrage. And the reason why is really important for us to look at, because the Conservatives believed um, that the addition of propertied women voters also voting would mean increased votes for them and a tightening of the stronghold that the Conservative Party had over their grip of power. So they really thought, actually, um, uh, sorry, like, believing that, you know, if we could just keep it to the, the propertied women, then that would be, that would be strengthening their movement, that would be improving their situation in Britain. And so you can see what, I, I think it's really important to see that opposing 
um, the vote in certain ways and supporting it in others was a way for them to manipulate um, the vote for women in order to get what they wanted and maintain their control. And I think this is a lesson to be learned generally about liberation struggles that are not connected to the class struggle. That it's very um, easy, as we can see here, for people who are opposed to... Um, greater democracy and, and equal distribution of, of wealth and, and really, you know, a greater improving of society, people who want to maintain their own hold can use liberation struggles to win people over to their um, perspectives. Um, in contrast to that, um, the Liberal Party was quite divided, so um, I'm going to talk about the Labour Party in a minute, but the, la the Liberals um, were quite worried. They thought that... Um, you know, they were worried that all these women, regardless of their um, their class, really, would be because of their lack of lack of education in comparison to men. They were like, oh well, you know, these women might be more likely to be influenced by the traditional viewpoints, and therefore will vote conservative anyway. And so you can see how the vote for women wasn't just about the issue of gender equality; it was also brought kind of by all the other political parties as a way for them to increase their vote, not because they want greater democracy, but because they want their greater share of power essentially um so the the kind of beginning of the main suffragette and suffragist parties began with with the pacifists with the suffragists who had been campaigning for years and years and years and there's a great quote um by the uh, founder Millicent Fawcett of the suffragists who said we are a glacier slow moving but unstoppable um and I think that really encapsulates the essence of the suffragist movement like they were really convinced that slow and steady runs the race and if they just kept on for long enough then real change would come about but you can see the, the evidence is right there after like 40 to 50 years nothing had changed they were no closer to getting the vote. Um, and I think some people like to believe that that slow change would have occurred, but I think um, that the events um, of the war later on and the suffragettes' actions themselves that we'll talk about in a minute um, prove that position to be incorrect. So um, they got really established in um, 1897, and I don't want to get bogged down in loads of acronyms, so there's only two that I'm really going to use. Um, the NUWSS, so this is the pacifist movement, the National Union of, of Women's Suffragist Societies, and I always remember it's like the one with all the S's, like pacifist S's. Um, so this organisation is the Millicent Fawcett one that I just talked about, um, and their focus is, that, and their belief is just that they want to lobby for change, and that through petitions and organisations, that's how they will achieve the vote um, and this is also partly based on ideology it's not based on like any material conditions it's not that they'd seen this happen earlier and thought great this is a good idea it was based on the belief and their understanding and again I suppose it's internalised oppression that they had to prove that women were sensible and the only way they could do that is by winning the vote through these calm and measured um, me like methods and they were like this is we've got to prove them wrong um, and obviously that's proving idiocy wrong really because um they they didn't achieve anything and if anything they proved themselves wrong in many ways um so obviously the labor party i mentioned earlier um was was more closely linked with the vote the campaign for the votes for women from the from the earlier days um it was later on that we can begin to see a split away so to begin with um you know there is a there is a stronger focus on on working women and the suffragists try to kind of bring working class women into the organisations and the groups that they were setting up uh, more so at the beginning of the campaign and it seems to kind of like get lost as you um, go down the lines and uh, we'll talk a bit about why in a minute. Um, so they believed that parliamentary methods were the way to change so not just the pacifist methods but through the parliament itself that they had to get in there and they had to use the petitions as a way to just persuade people to their point of view um and they had by 1914 over 500 branches and over 500,000 members right across the country so obviously that's that's not just in the main towns not just in the main cities but uh, wider than that 500 is a, a lot of branches um and the NUWSS is the one that includes male campaigners as well the suffragettes were solely women but this campaign tried to incorporate men as well. And, and there is a, a kind of picking up of men who are campaigning and want to be involved in women achieving the vote. Um, so, um, whilst this was happening, the WSPU, the suffragettes, um, and it's P because I think they're more political. And um, Anyway, uh, these acronyms... You <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not helping, am I? Um, anyway, so as this slow glacier is ongoing, um, meanwhile, the suffragettes begin to establish themselves from 1903, and it, it begins in Manchester, as I'm sure people are aware, with the Pankhursts. Um, and they were aligned to begin with the with the Independent Labour Party, um, which was a centrist organisation that was incredibly radical in its tone. Um, later in its days, talking about um, you know overthrowing capitalism and overthrowing the ruling class. So you can see this very radical beginnings of it. Um, however, it doesn't it doesn't remain like that because the Pankhursts have a problem with the Independent Labour Party and their campaign for universal suffrage, and they believe that it's too heavily focused on men. And so you see a split away later. Um, but um, they they begin this really because of the disillusionment with the failure of the suffragists to make any amount of change in the time that they've been campaigning. Uh, they see it as very limited progress and they think that the answer to that, therefore, is that we must have more militant means. We must have more um, more action. We must be getting in people's faces. faces. And, and, and this phrase that I really hate is action, like, of raising awareness. So they a lot of their tactics and their um, more militancy is based on the idea that they need um, more awareness of the vote for women, therefore they're going to cause as big a fuss and make as much of a nuisance of themselves as possible um, and, in, and in some ways you know that that is a positive thing to do and that is a necessary step so they're ta- they're kind of um what's the word motto yeah um is deeds not words so they're saying you know we've, we've talked enough it's not got us anywhere we now need to do something different um and so, as I said, the early years focused on working class women, but this begins to dwindle away slightly um, as they, they their focus shifts from that to this kind of small group terrorism in a way. Um, how far through am I? Thank you. Um, so, um, a lot of their campaigns become quite violent, and I'm going to come on to specifically talk about the violence in a minute, but um, they... Um, have a lot of arson campaigns they begin bombing campaigns um, and they really do cause quite a lot of awareness amongst the public but draw a lot of negative attention to themselves especially especially because um, the attention that they're gaining comes through the press and of course the press is a, um, an arm of the state and so they don't look upon them favourably they're not trying to raise the issues of why they're doing this it's all negative critique um, and their aim obviously as I said was to create this kind of spectacle um, but this garnered a lot of attention from the, the anti-suffragists who were saying, well, you know, look, this absolutely proves that women are completely hysterical and irrational. How on earth could you consider giving these people a vote? And so their tactics begin to sort of turn people off, turn them away. It's not um, reaching out and encouraging people to get involved. And it doesn't explain why they're doing these tactics. Um, people are starting to look at it and, and obviously their opinion is twisted by the media as a, as a negative thing that is just proving that women are completely... Um, should stay separate from, from the voting and that men should make those decisions for them. Um, so this militancy increases rapidly from 1909 onwards up to um, the war, essentially, in 1914, um, and causes a lot of splits. People become increasingly irritated with the tactics and the lack of um, political outreach to other groups of people, women and men. Um, in particular, Sylvia Pankhurst famously splits away and forms the East London Federation of Suffragettes, um, which, again, I, I want to come on to Sylvia in a bit more detail later because she's an, an important figure, um, especially when you're thinking about like socialism and how we move forward. So this, I mean, I don't want to read a big list of splits, but it's safe to say there were at least five um, major splits that occurred partly because of this attitude towards the politics and the, and the uh, militancy, but also because the Pankhursts were seen as quite authoritative figures. There was very limited democracy within the suffragettes. Or, well, there was democracy, but um, they opposed greater democracy at a few key instances. Um, and so many women felt that how can we campaign for democracy when we don't even have, we don't even practice with our own internal democracy in this organisation. And so again, you've got splits as a consequence of that. Um, and I got a lot of this information from a, an online course that I did by the Royal Holloway and I thought it was quite interesting to see that there were a lot of splits away at the time because people were opposed to militancy and on the course there was kind of like this poll that was done like do you, which of these reasons do you think is um, why the women like lost all of the support and, and what, what are the ways you think women should progress forward and get the vote in the future and I didn't I don't have the exact figures but it was well over 70% of people on the on the course learning about this, reading everything, all of this information about how the uh, campaigns went and they were like, oh, pacifism is the way forward and so I think like there is a, t- a general trend in um, society perhaps that still exists today that people like to choose the path of least resistance but also um, often people think, I think, that um, violent actions are, are 
completely to be opposed at all times that that it should you know change should be achieved through the most peaceful process possible and whilst that obviously is true i'd much rather have changed through peace um it possibly is quite naive and and doesn't actually account for the fact that this pacifism had existed for so long and these women were exacerbated they were angry they wanted change now and so this 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 kind of violence i think is if not justifiable definitely understandable um and so let kind of let's talk about this violence a little bit more because it is quite extreme and some of it perhaps not the best thing to do. Um, so the, the the press use this kind of blanket term of suffrage outrages in a way to try and make it sound like it's just hysteria, like these these women are just outraged. Um, and also that had been used as a term historically as well to describe like acts of violence and um, and like small bombing campaigns and things. Um, so the things that they begin to um, implement are bombs, arson campaigns, they cut telephone wires, they have a lot of events where they collectively smash windows, um, there are threats sent, um, there's even an attack on the Prime Minister, um, and I think, you know, today we would see these as terrorist attacks, they were at the time and they were completely unprecedented, people were understandably quite shocked and surprised by these, and there was a sense of panic and, and terror that they were trying to create, especially in the cities like London, um, but it was Christabel, Ameline's daughter, the uh, Pankhurst, sorry, um, who was the most vocal and persuasive. Like, there's loads of accounts of Christabel going around to people's houses who just joined up the suffragettes and convincing them, persuading them that a bit of action and militancy is um, the way to go forward and, and the way that they should be progressing if they want to do anything meaningful for the cause. Um, and she views what they're doing as revolutionary. She views these actions as the thing that will, will cause a real change. She obviously doesn't mean that in the sense that we might mean that, but she, she thinks that this is, this is the only way. And she's very, very public and vocal about the militancy and getting more people involved. Um, now, as part of the leadership, Christabel maintains that the attacks that they carry out and the violence that they carry out is just against the propertied classes, or it's just against property, um, not against people. But actually, in reality, there are there are a few instances where that isn't the case, unfortunately. Although that I would say is the is the main trend, so we shouldn't move away from that. Of course, there are always um, like small kind of exceptions that break the rule but I think so so on the whole this was um against just property but some of it wasn't um so as I mentioned they tried to attack the prime minister Asketh at the time um when he was in Ireland and they threw explosive material into a packed theatre um so regardless of who was in there obviously he's not going to be surrounded by members of the working class in a theatre in Ireland in the early 1900s but um, the point is that, like, this is an example of how um, they really kind of stepped up their the terrorist actions against people. And this was carried out into um, working class areas as well. There were loads of um, bombing campaigns organised for trains going in and out of London that they tried to time and coordinate. And often it was the third class carriages that were, were most affected by this. Um, which would have included more working class people. So the tactics are are not to be completely dismissed but certainly to be questioned in terms of the lack of outreach and attempt to connect what they were doing to the actual struggle for the vote and to a working class struggle more broadly um so this sense of panic really picks up in 1913 and, and you, you can get a real sense of the, the frustration that people are feeling and this is on a massive scale and so what happens is all of these women um, are arrested obviously um, on massive massive scales to the extent that the, they can, the, the prisons that they have can no longer cope with the number of suffragettes in the prisons and it's also because of the actions of the suffragettes so the suffragettes go on hunger strike repeatedly which leads to the the tor literal torturous treatment of force feeding of these women and the accounts I'm not going to repeat are horrific of, of what was done to these women and so what they had to do was they introduced a cat and mouse act which um, really explains the treatment that these women went through where they had so many women that were at risk of death in their care they had to release them allow them to go home and heal and also like free up a bit of space in the prisons and then they come back at a later date to finish their prison sentence. I think that tells you all you need to know about the the extent of the torture of the women. They were on the point of death and they had to be released home and they had an act of parliament to um, establish that. Um, oh, I should have written down the real name of the act, the Cat and Mouse Act, I should know is its nickname. Um, so this is happening right up until 1904 and the outbreak of war, which really causes a, a dramatic shift in the events where um, all of a sudden the outbreak of war happens and the Pankhursts declare a complete cessation of any militancy and they donate all of their funds to the war effort. Not only do they donate all of their funds to the war effort, they rebrand the suffragette 
paper, their main campaigning newspaper, the way that they take their radical ideas to the people, the Britannia. So we have this like complete flip-flop of positions from being entirely opposed to a government that is torturing women for campaigning for the right to vote and also for their violence to one that is offering unflinching support to the government and their actions. Um... And obviously, this isn't. Um, this is, she's not, enjoy, not. This isn't all of the groups across the country who are campaigning for the vote that take this on. But it is um, the suffragettes led by the Pankhursts, and they get heavily involved in setting up all kinds of um, support groups for people and organising um, funds and, and materials to support the war effort. Um, and then, of course, alongside this kind of shift, we begin to see um, a lot, a lot more women being employed for the war effort as doctors and nurses and then later in the munitions factories. Um, and so the government, seeing this sort of shift, reluctantly take these women on board as part of the war effort. Um, so, um, I mean, kind of negative, but positive in some ways that women were involved in the war effort in such an extent. Negative in the terms of the suffragettes completely abandoning um, their principled argument against the government and you can kind of see some confusion politically there um, but in terms of women getting involved in the war effort it led to a huge increase in women in trade unions so women becoming more politicised especially working class women and we see an increase of 160% during the war years of women's membership to trade unions and that's that's no surprise but I think that's a good um, a very large figure to be to be looking at especially when you think that these women were employed on lower wages than men to do the exact same jobs um, and so <clears throat> The politicisation of women is very important um, at this stage. Um, and Sylvia Pankhurst really is the only one with a class analysis um, who came out of the suffra suffragette movement um, and, and who has a campaigning group who's working during the war years against the government still. Um, and she is really keen to remain active. She agitates for strike action. Um, she ag agitates for a continuing a continuation of the militancy that the women had had to com to continue campaigning for the vote. Um, she continued to campaign for safe working conditions, for equal pay. She wasn't campaigning on the single issue of votes for women. She was linking votes for women to the working class struggle to be rid of, of capitalism in general. Um, and, you know, she's she's really campaigning for workers um, to be striking during the actual war and um, to create as much... Um, confusion and as much disruption as is physically possible and she says i wanted to rouse those women of the submerged masses to be not merely the argument for more fortunate people so like which is what the suffragettes were asking but to be fighters on their own account despising mere platitudes and um catch cries revolting against the hideous conditions about them and demanding for themselves and their families a full share in the benefits of civilization and progress so she's really pushing in terms of her rhetoric for women to be engaged not just in the struggle for the for the vote for women and and hope that that will cause further changes but saying like look don't just campaign for this. Be entirely political. Campaign for everything. And I think that's really powerful, that bit at the end where she says, to share in the benefits of civilization and progress, like, entirely. And that's for all people. Um, and I think it's kind of important to point out at this point that from here on, Pank Sylvia Pankhurst goes on to uh, be one of the founding members of the Communist Party and um, Emmeline Pankhurst goes on to run as a Conservative candidate and this really <laughs> lays bare their, their class differences, right? Um, so um, Sylvia is particularly um, radicalised through her... Um, sort of obviously the experiences of the, the developing revolution in Russia, but also she's like travelling around the north of England a lot more and is much more aware of the perhaps working class conditions and the, the situations that working women are in. Um, and so she begins to really question the tactics of the suffragettes. She's, she sees through the militancy and she sees how it turns off working women and how it doesn't reach out to explain their situation and how this will cause a win for women. Um, and it's not because she's got a problem with militancy and it's not because she doesn't want to go on hunger strike. She herself is involved in a lot of militancy against the state and is on hunger strike like over 10 times in, in a year herself. Um, but it's because she sees how divisive the actions of the suffragettes on their own were. And she saw this lack of outreach um, and said that what was needed was not more serious militancy but the few, uh, by the few, but a stronger appeal to the great masses to join in the struggle. Um, and, and that's a much better perspective. That's certainly something that um, that we could support. Um, 
And so, um, you know, she continues to, to um, campaign for strikes, and the strikes do happen. Um, between 1911 and 1914, there are many key um, sections of the working class that go on strike, the dockers, transport workers, railway workers, engineers, and, and this has a very profound effect on the, the, the mindset of the government, um, which I'll, I'll come on in more detail in a minute. Um, so, obviously, the war and everything that's happening that Pankhurst is observing is, is greater hardship for the working-class women more than anybody else. It is always the working-class women who face the brunt of, um, of, of any kind of um, austerity measures and, and pulling away of reforms. And so she was seeing this, this you know, campaign for the vote that ended in the vote for just um, the, the you know women over thirty and the propertied women, um, and she calls it a, a fancy fran- franchise because they they called the vote the franchise the enfranchisement. Um, so yeah, she's she's quite scathing about it um, and becomes incredibly disillusioned with the parliament and parliamentary methods and um, the kind of social democracy that exists. Um, and um, she uh, kind of takes on an almost quite an ultra-left position. She says, you know, Parliament is an institution that's been manipulated by the capitalist class and we should have nothing to do with it. We can have no illusions in Parliament. We can have no illusions in the capitalist democracy. Um, and we should, as communists, never participate in it. Uh, she says, we're like, we should have nothing to do with it at all. It's poisonous. Um, and, and Lenin actually criticised Panker, Sylvia Pankhurst for this because he said that, you know, well, the... The sort of broader perspective, I suppose, is that you should partake in politics, you should partake in the existing social democracies, as long as the working class are looking to those organisations and working within them and campaigning there themselves in order to prove um, your own perspective and be able to have a platform for that and explain to people why it is that reforming capitalism is not a viable option. Um, so she um, called the 19 extension this fancy franchise um, because it was only limited to the property owners. And whilst that is true to a certain extent, um, the vote that was given to these women showed the fear that the ruling class had at this time of the working class. It shows that they were doing something and um, that was that they were scared of. But also, of course, you've got the impact of events around the rest of Europe as well. Um, and so um, they were they were fearful that women workers in the factories would link up with the male workers on strike and that they could have their own revolution or something that would turbulently disrupt the social democracy that they were um, presiding over. Um, and of course, um, these, I think, are the more real pressures that caused the vote to be given in 1918, not this idea that um, women were given the vote as a reward for their, their actions in, in uh, the, during the war. Like, thank goodness the suffragettes gave us all that money and took to our side. So some people do believe that this idea the suffragists had to begin with of, like, calm and patient work, showing them that women aren't hysterical was the reason why the vote was given. But actually, when you look at the material conditions, that's just not the case. Um, so the 1918 Representation of People Act enfranchised all working class men for the first time. Um, and so conservatives were incredibly scared that, again, if they didn't give women the vote, then um, they would have more of a fight on their hands because of this. And they thought that giving the vote to some women would kind of offset that and placate them. As is the situation with, with you know a lot of reforms. Reforms aren't granted because governments want to um, give away more of the state spending and things. They're given to placate the working class to prevent um, further struggles from occurring at a later date. And of course, the end of the war saw this revolutionary wave in addition to the 1917 uh, right across Europe with revolutions in um, Russia and Germany and and the rest of Central Europe. And these revolutionary governments were granting women the vote immediately. And so again, you have the pressure of the actions of the working class around the rest of Europe having an impact on, on... the situation of the working classes in countries where they don't have a socialist revolution happening. So when we talk about, um, you know, the need to build for revolutions in countries all around the world, revolutions have such a big impact around on, on countries outside of them that it's not just for the benefit of the, the workers in that country. We can see how that spreads quite widely. Um, so I think it's my, um, the pressure of all of these events together that led to the, um, the vote being granted. But as we can see today, um, that still hasn't led to equality. And these women, all, they never saw it as a complete panacea, but they did, as I said at the beginning of the talk, hope that this would lead to large amounts of change. And there has been changes. There has been positives. Um, obviously, women have much more greater equality now than they did in um, the early 1900s. Um, but as I mentioned at the start, 
there are still large inequalities that exist. Um, there is a, a pay gap in gender, not because uh, largely women are paid a different amount to do the same job, but because women are more likely still today to be in the low-paid, precarious work. They are still the primary caregivers. The, if the number of single parents who are women compared to men is, is something like 80 to 20. Um, I could go on. We're very aware of the situation that we live in, though. Um, so I think, you know, there's still a way to go. So what can we learn from the suffragettes? Well... The most important things, I think, boil down to three sort of key points, really, that um, pacifism against the capitalist state alone does not work. We are not going to gradually chip away at a state that has complete um, control over the working class. We are at the beck and call because that is the way class society works. Um, secondly, violent actions that are disconnected from the working class alienate people. If that militancy isn't connected to a strong and clear understanding of how this is going to bring about change, um, then people are turned off by that they're not interested in violence for the sake of violence um and it has to be coordinated in such a way that it, extend, it extends and expands people's understanding people need an alternative not just to see something being smashed they need something to replace that an idea to hold on to and therefore um that leads us you know to the idea that it is the pressure from the working class that leads to the changes that we see in society. It isn't because of this withering away and it isn't because of just individual acts of terrorism. It's the pressure of coordinated, organised working classes in trade unions striking and showing who it really is that controls society, who really has the power. And it is that that led to women getting the vote and it is that that will need to be happening again in the future if we are to see any real change. Capitalism is the enemy. It isn't just the fact that we need to tinker around and make a reform. It is the entire system that needs to be overthrown if we're to see the real change that the suffragettes and the suffragists were campaigning take a hold and, and, and be um, prevalent in society as a whole. Um, and, and finally, I think that has to be done through connecting the struggle for women's emancipation to the struggle for class like um, emancipation only through eradicating class society can we eradicate sexism and gender oppression entirely and that is what we should learn from the suffragettes we should learn about how their tactics were used and how we can use tactics in the future and we should learn most importantly about that pressure that the working class can put on and how it is the working class that are the real people who control society and have therefore the power to change it thank you